Welcome to this topic video on separable differential equations. So as we had studied differential equations, we were first introduced to figuring out what a differential equation was exactly saying. Then we were asked to try to visualize what a differential equation might actually look like. And we found that there are lots of different types of solutions that all end up being you know, vertical translations of each other, sometimes horizontal translations of each other. It really depends on exactly what the differential equation you started with is. But the idea is that a general solution, there's like this family of solutions and how do you know which one is which? Also, how do you get the actual explicit equation out? And so separable differential equations are a specific type that we were taught how to explicitly solve for. As you're working on your final exam, you should always be on the lookout for separable differential equations. They kind of all look very similar in the sense that they look like a product of a function of the parent function value variable and then a function of the input variable. So for instance, if you are looking at something like dy dt is equal to, there you go, y squared times t. Note that the function is named y, right? So there's something involving y on the left-hand side. And then it's multiplied by something involving the input variable, which is t. We know that y itself is a function of t, and yet we have this product of y squared and t on the right-hand side. Note that something that's not separable is one where you might have dy dt is equal to y squared minus t, right? That's not a product at all. The reason that it has to be a product, right, the reason that we care mostly about something like this is that ultimately we're trying to separate everything involving y with everything involving t. And that's where the fact that it's a product comes into play. Because what ends up happening is that we can take everything involving y and put it on one side of the equation, everything involving t and put it on the other side of the equation, and the equality will still hold we're able to then anti-differentiate. Well, hold on, let me not get ahead of myself, right? Everything involving y on one side of the equation, everything involving t on the other, then we're able to anti-differentiate, and that's gonna get rid of that dy and dt, and then we're able to solve for y. I'm not gonna go into the full and complete uh, method of all the computation for this particular example that I just thought up to open this particular video, but you get the idea. And so the key here is to identify separable differential equations when you see them, understanding what kind of computation goes into these sorts of differential equations, and specifically how to find general solutions using this technique, as well as how to find particular solutions for this family of differential equations. So the problems that follow are the problems that appear on practice exams as well as old final exams, where the differential equation that you're given is a separable one and you're asked something around the gist of, uh, you know, what's the general solution for this differential equation? What's a particular solution given an initial condition or a particular function value like this? And sometimes there's more to it than that. And it's really helpful to just be aware of when you've encountered a separable differential equation because this procedure is extremely, extremely useful. Take a look down in the description of this video and you'll see the timestamps of the various problems that are walked through. Make sure to avoid the ones for the practice exams that you're planning on using. The rest of them are there for practice. And of course, if you've seen a problem, that doesn't mean that it's gone to waste. You know, print out a blank sheet of paper and do it from top to bottom. Happy studying and enjoy this video on separable differential equations. We begin with the financial modeling problem. We're told that a venture capitalist has found a business that claims to increase in value at a rate proportional to the square of its present value. If the business was worth $1 million a year ago and is worth $2 million today, how much should it be worth in six months? Now, a problem like this can seem really overwhelming at first, but you need to unpack it piece by piece, sort of in the order that the information is given to you. A venture capitalist has found a business that claims to increase in value at a rate proportional to the square of its present value. That's the first thing that we want to zoom in on. That's pretty important. And in fact, the little saying that should be screaming out at you is at a rate proportional to. 
the square of its present value. Well, let's name this function that tells us how much this is worth. And we're gonna call that function v, the value of this business at time t. So we'll say v of t is the value of the business at time t. When we say that the value of this business increases at a rate proportional to the square of its present value, that means the rate of change of the value, dv dt, is proportional to, as in a scalar multiple of, its present value, which is v, the square of its present value. So let's put that all into calculus speak. The rate of change, dv dt, is proportional to, that means k times the square of its present value, which is v squared. And of course, v here, we're implying v is that particular function, v of t. Now, we're also told that if the business was worth $1 million a year ago and is worth $2 million today, how much should it be worth in six months? Well, that whole thing, if the business was worth $1 million a year ago and is worth $2 million today, that is trying to help us figure out what k is. This isn't one of those more straightforward situations where it tells you a specific rate of change at a specific value for the company, so we can't just like plug in and solve for k, but we notice that this particular type of differential equation is a separable differential equation. This is something that we can solve because really what we're about to do is divide by v as long as v is not zero, which no, the company's value is not zero. As long as v is not zero, we can use separable differential equations to solve this. So let's take a look. We want to put everything with v on one side, everything involving t on the other. All right, then we anti-differentiate. What do we get out of this? Well, we have negative 1 over v equals kt plus c. I shoved all the constants onto one side. We need to solve for v. So first of all, that factor of negative 1 has to disappear and we have to sort of cross multiply or you could say invert either side. Awesome. We now have this fantastic equation for v. It's excellent, right? Unfortunately, it has a couple of constants, right? It has k in there and also has c, but luckily we know that if the business was worth one million dollars a year ago and is worth two million dollars today, that whole preface those two values are going to really help us out. Let's say that t equals zero is today. That means that if the business was worth a million dollars a year ago, that means v evaluated at t equals negative one should be one million dollars. Let's use that piece of information to solve for what one of these constants should be. Of course, there's another part to it as well, right? We also know that it's worth two million dollars today. If I made a year ago, t equals negative one, that means today is t equals zero. So that also means that v evaluated at zero is equal to two million dollars. This is so much algebraically easier to deal with at first. So let's go with the t equals zero part because that's gonna totally get rid of that term. So knowing this, we're gonna plug in zero for t and see what one of our constants has to be. So we have negative one over, we now have zero plus c, that has to equal two million. I don't even know if I have the right number of zeros. I do, six of them, great. So negative one over C is equal to two million. Already I can see this number is gonna be really small and really unwieldy and part of the problem is that two million is such a big number, right? Well, it looks like this, the value of the business is pretty high in general. So we can actually change the definition of our function. So we'll say the value of the business in millions of dollars at time t, where t is in years. So that now means that v evaluated at negative 1 is equal to positive 1 v evaluated at 0 is just going to be equal to 2, and our lives become so much easier. There are so many fewer zeros. We have just had a miracle happen to us. And so when you're doing problems like this and you're realizing the computation is kind of nasty and you're the one who's saying what v is, like we invented the function v. Obviously we're being told that we need to find a differential equation that describes this process, but given that the value of the business is routinely in the millions, it's much easier for v's output to be in millions of dollars. That's one of those instances where 
you want to make your function a little bit easier to work with. So that means that c itself is just equal to negative one half. Now we can use the other fact that this function evaluated at negative one has to be equal to positive one in order to solve for k. So we know that v is going to be equal to negative one over, and we're now plugging in t equals negative one. So in the denominator here, we have hmm, k times negative one plus, and then we have negative one half is c. So we have negative one half here. We already solved for that. And that whole thing has to be equal to positive one. Rewriting that a little bit more neatly, we have negative one over negative k minus one half. There's a lot of negative signs here. So I'm gonna factor out a negative sign in that denominator. Feel good about that. I'm gonna have negative and then I'll have k plus one half down here equals one. These two negative signs will cancel. So I have one over k plus one half is equal to one. Let's cross multiply that. We're then gonna have one equals k plus one half. So that means that k is equal to positive one half. Whew, okay. Putting that all into our answer for v, we know that v of t is now gonna be equal to, well, negative one over t over two minus one half. But we're not even done yet. We need to double check. It's asking us how much should it be worth in six months. We said that today was time t equals zero. So six months is time t equals 0.5. So that means that v of t, v of 0.5 is equal to negative one times 0.5 over two minus one half. Now, of course, 0.5 over two, that's just one fourth. And one fourth minus one half is negative one fourth. And negative one divided by negative one fourth is positive four. So we have four. Our final answer though, we need to sort of put it in, it's not just four, it's four what? It's four million dollars. Remember that we made our output for V millions of dollars. So we can say, okay, four comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. That is how much it should be worth in six months. four million dollars. Now the follow-up question to this is could the business sustain this type of growth indefinitely and how would it do in the long term? Well practically speaking have you ever seen a business sustain this type of growth indefinitely? It literally went from two million to four million dollars in six months. And so it's asking us practically speaking you know knowing very limited obviously this is not a business class but you're humans in the world the question is, you know, given this growth rate, what does that mean? What would you expect to happen? So, I mean, the answer is no, this growth rate is not sustainable. So no, growth not sustainable. You know, even the most successful companies eventually slow down as far as growth goes. It says, how would it do in the long term? Um, well, eventually growth would probably taper off, is what I would say. And of course, those of you who are saying, hey, like, how am I supposed to figure that out? I mean, here's the thing, though, is that you want to look at V of T, that function that we found that described the value of the company as a function of time. What happens as T goes to infinity? I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Just take a look at what happens when you approach the end of the first year, t equals one. At t equals one, right, v of one is equal to negative one over one half minus one half. That doesn't even work. That's a denominator of zero. This is going to diverge. It's gonna be infinite. That's completely insane. So no, this is not, this type of growth is not sustainable. A company is not going to have infinite value after year one, that's impossible. So that's another way to figure out the answer to part B. But it's generally just a pretty short sort of common sense, what does this growth rate mean in the greater context of things? Up next, we have another financial example that ends up being a separable differential equation. Here we have Norman. He's interested in investing with a money manager, Barney Muchoff's financial firm, BMIS. You probably can tell around what year 
this question was authored. If Norman invests right now, BMIS predicts that the value, V, of his investment in T years will grow according to the differential equation given here. Now, Norman decides to invest his lunch money, $5, with BMIS right away. It says, show that if Muchoff's prediction is correct, Norman will have root $10,025 in 10 years. That's awesome. Um, and right away, as you're reading over this question, the thing that you should be looking at whenever someone is telling you to basically solve a differential equation, and of course it doesn't say anywhere explicitly, solve a differential equation, but when it says show that Norman will have this many dollars in 10 years, that's sort of implying that you should somehow arrive at a function that when you plug in t equals 10, you'll get root $10,025. So that means that somewhere along the line, you need to find the function v. And so when you look at this differential equation right away, you're sort of like, hey, that's a separable differential equation. Your ears should always perk up when you're seeing separable differential equations and be sort of prepared to solve them if you're being asked to. And in this case, you are. So what do we want to do? We want to take everything that's involving V, put it on the left-hand side, everything that's involving T, put it on the right-hand side. Next, we integrate or anti-differentiate on either side and cluster the constants onto the right-hand side because we're really seeking to isolate V. Again, continuing in the vein of isolating V, we want to solve for V and that will become our function V of T. Here's what that looks like, and it may sort of seem like you have an option to think about the positive or negative square root of square root of t to the fourth plus 2c, but of course this is the value of an investment, so it really ought to be positive. We only care about the positive square root side of this. Of course we have this issue here with this constant. We really need to solve it. and. Even further simplifying, you know, two times a constant is just another constant, so I'll change its name to A. We know that Norman's investment is $5 at the very beginning of his time investing with Barney Muchoff. So we know that V at 0 is going to be equal to 5. So at time t equals 0, it's worth $5. That's the value of the investment. So that alone, that initial condition is going to allow us to solve for A. Let's do that. And so solving for a, we find that a has to equal 25. Knowing what this constant is now equal to, we know that v of t, with no constants involved at all, is the square root of t to the fourth plus 25. Now we can use this to show that if Norman invests after 10 years, he'll have root $10,025. Again, as I said at the beginning, that question is implying I have some function v that I can plug in a t value into and get out an investment value. So that means that our final answer involves saying, hey, if I evaluate v at year 10, that means that it'll be 10 to the fourth plus 25, which of course does end up being square root of 10 to the fourth, which is 10,000 plus 25. So we have 10,025 in here. And so we can say, yes, look, show that we have shown that the end. That is the only part of this problem that involves a separable differential equation. So we're going to leave that there. The rest is a tie back to Taylor polynomial approximation, which you can check out on your own. Our next problem involves straight up just solving a differential equation that we're given. x times dy dx equals arctan natural log of x with a given initial condition. And so this is really just solve this. There's no, oh, I wonder what they're asking me to do. They're telling you what to do. You got to solve it. This is a separable differential equation. We can take everything that involves x and put it on one side and everything that involves y and put it on the other. And of course, that's going to be our first step. Let's take a look. Here's what we've got. Our next step is that we want to anti-differentiate or integrate with respect to y on the left-hand side, x on the right-hand side. And of course, this poses quite a challenge for at least the right-hand side of things. The left-hand side is going to be pretty well behaved. The right-hand side involves some finagling. First thing is that we need to use u substitution, right? We can see right away that there is a function and its derivative that appears here. First, 
uh, u is natural log of x and du is 1 over x dx. So just that alone allows us to rewrite this antiderivative in a much cleaner way. So here's what we have so far. Certainly the right-hand side has been cleaned up a little bit, but then there's this feeling of like, oh god, this is still pretty messy. And in fact, we need to use integration by parts on the right-hand side to be able to integrate it. And of course, the thing that is easiest to anti-differentiate is what you want to make dv. The thing that is easiest to differentiate is what you want to make u. So let's do that. So I'd like to point out that first of all, I know that integration by parts, traditionally we name the pieces u and dv, but I kind of already used the name u earlier in the problem, so I just called it w for the integration by parts. I made w equal to arctan, the function that is easier to differentiate instead of anti-differentiate. Of course, if you tried to anti-differentiate arctan, the whole point is that we can't really do that. So w definitely needs to be arctan. Uh, dw then becomes 1 over 1 plus u squared du. dv is the only factor that's left, which is du, so that means that v becomes u. Now let's apply the integration by parts formula to figure out what we now have on our right-hand side. All right, we are quite close. We just have one final integral to do, this one right here, and this one We'll actually work with some nice u substitution, but since I've used u and v and w, I'm gonna pick s, s substitution. S is for substitution. So I'm gonna make one plus u squared equal to s, and then ds is going to be two u. So we're left with u arctan u minus one half times the integral of one over s ds. Note that we need that additional factor of one half to counter the fact that Due to our choice of substitution, we actually have 2u du as our ds factor, but we actually just have 1 times u du in the numerator of the original integral. So we need to multiply by 1 half to make the substitution equality hold from one line to the next. And now we can finally anti-differentiate completely. Note that there are quite a few moments where we actually have to unsubstitute. It's a really good thing to remind ourselves that the original function y up here is a function of x. We can tell that because it's saying the derivative of y with respect to x, and everything's written in terms of x. And all we have down here is u's and s's. So we want to unsubstitute everything. We have one substitution right here where s is equal to 1 plus u squared. And then we're also told that u is equal to natural log of x. Oof, my goodness. So that is the final answer for the general solution. but. We're being told we want a specific solution. Of course, it doesn't say that specific or particular solution, but when we're given this initial condition, note that this information has been given to us and we haven't used it yet. And the fact that when y, the function, is evaluated at x equals 1, we get e, that's information that allows us to solve for this constant we, that we clustered on to the right-hand side. So let's plug it in. Everywhere you see an x, put in a 1, set it equal to e, solve for c. There is so much that goes to zero. This is equal to zero, so this whole term goes to zero. And this is equal to zero, so now we have one plus zero, which is one, and so this is equal to zero, so this whole term goes to zero. And so E is equal to C. That is what C has to be equal to in order for that whole thing to evaluate to E. And so we imagine, we arrive at our final answer here, right? We have Y equals natural log of x times arctan natural log of x minus one half natural log of absolute value. I mean, this is pretty redundant. It could be absolute value or parentheses because at this point, what's inside here is strictly positive. But I will do parentheses one plus natural log of x quantity squared, and then it's no longer plus c, it's plus e. And that is our final answer. So mostly an integration question, but you know, the starting statement is how do you solve this differential equation? Our next problem is one in a potpourri, we'll say, of differential equations that you're being asked to solve. 
but only the second part is a separable differential equation. Remember again that you're sort of always looking for a product of the two variables, y and x, granted y itself is a function of x, but we're looking for a product of something involving x and something involving y, and whether we can identify that so that they can be separated from each other, hence separable differential equations. And so for instance, A in this problem is not a separable differential equation. There's no way to create a product of X and Y so that you could separate them apart. But here, we absolutely have the option to look at this through the lens of separability. Now you might be wondering, how is that? There's addition and subtraction. A lot of people sort of uh, distill that advice down to whenever I see plus x and minus y that means it's not separable but there is this here so like how is this separable but the other one not and the answer to that is remember your exponent rules yes you have e to the x plus y in the numerator but that can be rewritten as e to the x times e to the y and there you have the product of two functions one involving x one involving y that you can then separate so let's get to it Everything involving x on the right-hand side, everything involving y on the left-hand side. Here we go. Our next step is to anti-differentiate both sides. We're going to need a little help on the right-hand side, but let's get the left-hand side out of the way. Now, as I was saying on the right-hand side, this is a little bit tricky to integrate, but we need some u substitution. Our u is going to be everything underneath that radical sign, 3 plus e to the x because the derivative of that is just e to the x dx. So you can see that function derivative relationship there. That means we can rewrite the right-hand side with an integral that's just one over square root of u du. And that's something that we can uh, integrate quite nicely. But of course, before we get too, too excited, uh, we do need to realize that we have y on one side, u on the other, we need to get it back to x, noting that u itself is equal to 3 plus e to the x, so let's do that. Now of course we have to solve for y, so the first thing that we need to do is take the natural log of either side. I will take the intermediate step of first multiplying either side by negative 1, just so I have something nice and a positive exponentiation on the left hand side, you should do the same. There it is, so now let's take the natural log of both sides. Of course, the left-hand side is going to simplify to negative y because natural log and the exponential function are inverse functions of each other, so their effects will cancel. So we're left with negative y on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is the same as the line that we see here. This is now our general solution if we multiply by a negative 1, so let's do that. And we want to evaluate this at x equals 0 and get 1 in order to solve for c. We note that 3 plus e to the 0 is 3 plus 1, which is 4, whose square root is 2, and then negative 2 times 2 is negative 4. So we're left with negative natural log of negative 4 minus c inside that parentheses. We note that that means negative 1 is equal to natural log of negative 4 minus c. We can then exponentiate both sides to try to solve for c. And that tells us that e to the negative 1, or 1 over e, is equal to negative 4 minus c. Solving for c, we have negative 4 minus 1 over e. And so that gives us our final answer because we just take this and we want to plug it back into, this was our general solution right here. And so we have, as our final answer, which I'm going to write up near the initial question, y equals negative natural log of, and then what's inside here is negative 2 times root 3 plus e to the x, and then minus c, so that negative sign is going to distribute to every term of c, so it ends up being plus 4 plus oops, 1 over e, and that is it. That's our final answer. A great example of a separable differential equation that involves some integration techniques as well. Our next problem involves a separable differential equation that appears in the context of a physics question. So we're told that Harvard researchers have just released a new revolutionary braking technology. The force the braking system applies is directly proportional to both the current velocity 
and to the time elapsed since the brake was activated. So let V be the velocity in meters per second of an object T seconds after the brake is activated, and this scenario is well modeled by the following differential equation. And we're always on the lookout for separable differential equations. It says verify that the general solution of the differential equation is a some constant times e to the negative 2t squared. Well, the first thing that we want to do, this one is a nice one, right? It's verify that the following is true. There are a bunch of ways to do this. You can absolutely guess and check. You can say, hey, I'm going to compute the left-hand side of this differential equation, assuming that v is equal to this. And you can also say, okay, I'm going to compute the right-hand side of this differential equation, assuming that this is what v is equal to, and I'm going to show that the two are equal. So I'm going to do that sort of the second way. But the first way, which maybe not too many people uh, have that dawn on them, that this is a separable differential equation that you can actually solve from scratch. So let's take a look. We begin by separating everything involving t on one side and everything involving v on the other. Our next step is to integrate either side, collecting the constants on the right-hand side since we're trying to solve for v. Then we want to exponentiate either side since, again, we're trying to solve for v, trying to find that general solution. We know that this left-hand side can be simplified to just v and the right-hand side can also be rearranged to be e to the negative 2t squared times e to the c. Given that c is a constant, that means that e to the c is another constant. We'll change its name and call it a. And once we've done that, we find that, oh, yeah, v of t is equal to a times e to the negative 2t squared. And that's our final answer. So much shorter, four lines of computation really, to verify that the general solution of the differential equation is a times e to the negative 2t squared. That is the short way, using separable differential equations. The other way is to compute both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this differential equation, assuming v is equal to this, to show that they're equivalent. Here's the work. I'm not going to walk through it because this video is supposed to focus just on separable differential equations. We now take a look at B. It says, for the rest of the problem, suppose that the initial velocity of the object is 10. In function notation, that's going to say that V of 0 is equal to 10. Well. B immediately says write a formula for the specific solution, V, because this guy up here in purple, that's our general solution. So we want to say when t equals 0, this has to equal 10. So what does that mean that A needs to be equal to? In fact, this tells us since this is effectively raising E to the 0, this tells us that A is going to have to equal 10 in order for that initial condition to hold. So. That means that our particular solution, v of t, would be equal to 10 e to the negative 2t squared. Part c says, what is the velocity of the object after half a second of braking? This is just testing to see if you understand what you've actually found. What you found is velocity as a function of time. And when it's asking you what's the velocity after half a second, that's saying what's v equal to when t is equal to 1 half. Now, of course, 0.5 squared is just 1 fourth. Negative 2 times 1 fourth is negative 1 half. So our answer is really that it's 10 times e to the negative 1 half power. And that's it. And of course, if we want units there, we'll do meters per second because when we look back up at the top, we're told that velocity units are in meters per second, right there. And that is our final answer. The rest of this problem continues on to use Taylor series and power series representations, but we're not going to go into that. This was as much as used separable differential equations you can find 
more information about the rest of the solution in either the solution set or hopefully a forthcoming video. This question is the second part, really third and fourth part, I guess, technically, of a matching problem. And this part is actually focused on explicitly solving for both the general solution and particular solution of a differential equation, which of course happens to be separable. So let's begin. We note that we have a differential equation y prime equals y times sine t, and we see that that is a product of a function of t and a function of y, and so we find that they can be separated. Let's do that. Note that y prime should be first rewritten as dy dt before we begin. Now let's go ahead and separate everything involving y on the left, everything involving t on the right. We then anti-differentiate either side or integrate, whichever you prefer and collect the constants together onto the right-hand side. We want to solve for y, right? y is the function that obeys the differential equations relationship. So we need to exponentiate both sides in order to release it from that natural log over there. Once we do that, we now have absolute value of y on the left-hand side. And once we do that, let's rewrite the right-hand side. Instead of having a sum of terms up in the exponent, let's make it a product of two powers of e, so that when you combine them, you would add them together. I know that e to the c is just a constant, so I'm going to bring it in front. And also, absolute value of y indicates that the right-hand side could be either positive or negative, but the same thing is going not going to matter. When we solve for y, y is going to be equal to plus or minus e to the c times e to the negative cosine t. And of course, e to the c is a constant because we have a constant raised to a constant, which is just another constant. I'm going to rename it. And the fact that it's positive or negative doesn't change its constant status, so that plus or minus sign can get absorbed into the constant as well. What we're left with is our general solution. y is equal to some constant a times e to the negative cosine t. Now, of course, the second part is going to ask us to find a particular solution. We want to find the particular solution that also satisfies the initial condition, that when you plug in 0 for t, you get 1. So let's do that. Let's plug in 0 for t. a times e to the negative cosine of 0, and we want that to be equal to 1. So the question is, what does a have to be equal to in order for that to hold? We have one quick intermediate step. It says, hey, a times 1 over e is equal to 1. Solving for a, what do we have? a is going to be equal to e, and so we put that back into our general solution, saying y is equal to e times e to the negative cosine t. Now, of course, another way of writing this would be, hey, y is equal to e to the negative cosine t plus 1. Either one is suitable. Our final problem is a problem that's embedded in a differential equations medley. It is part B of this. The first couple problems ask you to look at various things. There's one part that's like qualitative analysis, and then this part is modeling a population. But part B here, you can tell right away, especially if you've been watching this particular video, this is ripe for a separable differential equation problem. So it says solve the differential equation with the initial condition. We see that everything is a product of functions of x or functions of y, and so we know we should be able to separate these. Let's do it. First, let's get everything involving x onto one side and everything involving y onto another. Now we want to anti-differentiate or integrate both sides and cluster the coefficients onto the right-hand side. We're trying to solve for y, remember? And already I'm stuck. This thing on the right hand side is a bit of a doozy. It needs u substitution in order for us to do it. And in fact, u is going to be equal to x squared plus 1 and du will be equal to 2x. Once we put that in, what are we left with now that we've substituted into our integral? Well, it's the integral of 1 half times 1 over root u. And we have that 1 half because we have we are missing that factor of 2 that's in our substitution in the actual integral itself. So we need to add that extra factor of 1 half in there. But now we can go ahead and actually take that antiderivative. It is really nice that 2 and 1 half cancel out and we're left with a factor of 1, but we do need to 
unsubstitute because we have y in terms of u. It's a little strange. We need it to be in terms of x. So we get that done. Now we need to solve for y. And sometimes it's easier algebraically, instead of writing negative y to the negative 1 half, we write that as negative 1 over y. We can cross multiply or invert both sides, whichever you prefer, but what we're about to end up with is the following for our general solution. We're halfway there, because we really need a particular solution. We're told not only do we need to solve this, but we need to find the particular solution such that when we plug in 0 for x, we're going to get out 2. That's going to allow us to solve for c. So let's do it. We find that 1 plus c is going to be equal to negative 1 half, which tells us that c itself is going to be equal to negative 3 halves. Putting that into our general solution, we finally have our particular solution. It's going to be y is equal to negative 1 over x squared plus 1 to the 1 half power minus 3 halves. And that's it. And we're finished. A nice integration technique. Again, buried inside a separable differential equation problem. Moving right along. This is the final problem in this particular topic focus, and it is part of a problem that started with matching and a little bit of sketching, but here finally you're given the opportunity to explicitly solve for the general solution of a particular differential equation. And of course, it's a separable differential equation. We're given that the differential equation for the function a is dA dt equals t times a squared, again a product of t and of a, so let's take that first step and let's separate them. Everything involving a on the left, everything involving t on the right. All right, take the antiderivative or integrate both sides, clustering the constants onto the right-hand side. Solving for a is a little bit easier if we express the left-hand side as negative 1 over a, so let's do that. And let's do it. Let's solve for a. What do we get? We have that a is equal to negative 1 over 1 half t squared plus c. Now, as you would typically expect, the second part of this question is asking you to find the particular solution of the differential equation given that when t is equal to 0, a should evaluate to negative 1. So let's plug in t equals 0 and see what c has to equal in order for that to happen. Lucky for us, most of the denominator disappears. In fact, everything does except for c. So we have that negative 1 is equal to negative 1 over c, which tells us that c must be equal to 1. Of course, that's not our final answer. Our final answer is the function a, but with a value of c equals 1. So we have a is equal to negative 1 over 1 half t squared plus 1. And that's our particular solution given that initial condition. The final part of this problem is very interesting. It says, what can you say about the limit as t approaches infinity for the function a of t? For the solution that you found in part d, does this agree with what you drew in part b? Well, I haven't gone through the part b part, but let's talk about what the limit is as t goes to infinity. Well, a is equal to negative 1 over 1 half t squared plus 1. So what happens as t goes to infinity? Well, t squared is going to grow without bound. 1 half t squared is going to grow without bound. And 1 half t squared plus 1 is going to grow without bound. I'm just looking at everything in that denominator. So the denominator is going to grow without bound. The numerator stays finite at negative 1, which means that a is going to approach, you got it, 0. And of course, if you've done the first part of this problem, you just need to double check that that is, in fact, what happens to your function a as time passes along your trajectory. As always, if you're studying this topic and you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email. Take a look down in the description of this video for more detail about specifically which class materials and which class sections you should pay attention to as far as worksheets and readings and stuff go if you're looking for an even deeper conceptual review of that material. Happy studying.